So I want to officially start this webinar. My name is Eileen Michelli, and with the Marketing Foundation. Um, welcome to our final webinar in our special surgery series, which is part of our educational efforts for Marketing Awareness Month. We're thrilled to bring to you outstanding medical information from leading surgeons from around the country who are also huge champions for the Marketing Foundation and of course, for our community. Um, tonight, we're featuring the fabulous Dr. Anthony Caffarelli from Hope Hospital in Orange County, California. And if you're suffering from the cold this winter, start planning for our 2022 annual conference, which will be hosted by Hope in Newport Beach and I promise you it's gonna be warm, beautiful, and amazing. Uh, before we get to our speaker and the official introduction of him, uh, first I'd like to ask our president and CEO, Michael Weimer, to say a few words. Thanks, Eileen, good evening. I just wanted to come by and say hello and check in with Dr. Caffarelli on how things are going and uh, you're in for a real treat this evening. You've heard of the uh, four great tenors. Well, we've had the four great surgeons. Uh, and this is uh, Eileen, Eileen noted as the wind down of, of that series. And, you know, we're also coming up on the end of Marfan Awareness Month. And thanks to everyone for your support of the foundation and all that we do. Uh, we will be in person uh, next year um, at home, which will be very exciting. After uh, two years, we were unable to an in-person conference but and i think we'll have a slide later on uh this coming july we will have a virtual annual conference and it's going to be focused about 75 percent on connecting and probably 25 percent on the more traditional medical and other kinds of programming so uh, people have really been looking for an opportunity to connect and our conference is hopefully going to provide a a wonderful opportunity to do that so Tony, thank you for everything you do. You're amazing. And it's an honor to be here tonight in your company. Eileen, back to you. Great, thank you. Thanks, Michael. Um, so as you know, tonight um, we are talking about aortic arch surgery. Um, we do have an opportunity for you to ask your questions. Many of you submitted questions in advance. Um, so what I um, recommend is wait till the end of the presentation because I'm sure Dr. Caffarelli is gonna be answering a lot of what you're gonna be asking, and then just put your questions in the Q&A box. The chat um, is just for chatting, but we're gonna look at the Q&A box later for the questions. Um, and we'll leave time at the end. We'll leave plenty of time for that at the end. So our speaker tonight is Dr. Anthony Caffarelli, the Director of Cardiothoracic Surgery at Hove, as well as Director of the Elaine and Robert Matranga Aortic Center, and the Newkirk Family Endowed Chair in Aortic Care at Hove. He performs hundreds of cardiac and thoracic procedures annually, specializing in complex aortic procedures, including aneurysms, dissections, bicuspid aortic valve disease, and valve sparing root procedures. Uh, for us at the Marfan Foundation, as you've heard, Dr. Caffarelli is a, is a true champion. On top of his outstanding clinical care, he's always there for our community. Together with Dr. David Liang, a professional advisory board member who now splits his time between Stanford and Hogue, they have built a premier aortic center and provide comprehensive care for people with Marfan, low seats, and beds, as well as other aortic conditions. I also need to shout out his team, including Rita, who did the set decoration as we heard tonight. And of course, his clinic coordinator, Meg Boglin, who is an amazing advocate for, for our community. And she also has firsthand experience as somebody who has beds. Um, Dr. Caffarelli and Hogue are huge supporters of our Southern California Walk for Victory. And um, I'm not sure that orange mustache is gonna make an appearance tonight, but um, it's always a lot of fun down in Newport Beach. Um, and as you've heard uh, many times already tonight, um, Hogue is gonna be sponsoring or, and hosting our um, 2022 in-person conference in Newport Beach next summer. So with that, I will get rid of my audio and video and pass the remote over to Dr. Caffarelli. Thanks, Eileen. Thanks, uh, Michael. Let me, so Eileen, as far as sharing my screen, there we go. And. So you have that? Uh, allow Zoom to share your screen, open system preference. So. Yeah, let me try it. Let me try again here. Let me just get this, let me do this. And then I can give, let me see, remote control, Anthony Caffarelli. Okay. 
How about now? Uh, share a screen. And then you pick your screen. Yeah. Sorry about this. Says okay. System preference. This is live TV. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Allow the Aspilla recorded contents. Yes. We may have to call a friend. Hey, uh -oh. Rita. Uh, you do it, Meg? Meg's coming in to save the day. Allow Zoom. It's not letting it happen. You did that? Yeah, I did that. And then that pulls up. I hit desktop. But it says. Is it up on your screen? Yeah, it says allow Zoom to share your skiing, which I've done many times before. So click on the presentation, it will highlight and then go back and at the bottom and press share. Yeah, nope, I understand. Um, Hey, Eileen, on I my know. screen, it's showing that I can share screen. Right. So should I be able to, should I be off that? Yeah, just, yeah, if it, if it said, where it says remote control, make sure it says, to, um, yeah, I mean, I picked, I picked uh, giving it to him, so. There we go. All panelists, who goes, oh, all panelists, try again. How about now? I'll try it one more time. Okay. I think it's on my end. Security. Why don't you? I'm going to. Um, Security. I'm going to send you a. Sorry, everybody. I'm going to send you guys a. Uh, Tony, I'm going to send you an email address. If you want to send me your slides, I'll put, pull it right up. You can send that. They just sent you that email address. You can send me the PowerPoint. I'll get it right up here. Um, I think I got to leave the meeting and log back on. It's telling me. Okay. All right. Okay. So hi, everybody. We'll see. Let's see. Let's see what's going on in the chat. I'm going to say hi too. Well, welcome. Everybody. I got, we've got Australia in the house. We've got Canada in the house. We've got Colorado in the house. Maybe what I could do is talk while he's doing that. Maybe I can show a couple of things that we were going to talk about later. Sure. So, yeah. So while I we're get, waiting. While I see we're, Carrie. Sorry. Sorry, Eileen. <laughs> okay. While we're waiting, let me just remind everybody that if your questions are not answered tonight, the best thing to do is to send them to Jan Lynch, who's our amazing nurse. There's a smiling face there. And the best way to do that is through our website, markdan.org slash ask. And then she will be able to answer those questions. Um, it's, this is way better than calling her or emailing her. So you can, you can use, um, use I, I, Eileen, by the way, there's a question from, I think it's Jess Winder from London. Oh, uh, we will continue to have virtual, uh, sessions. Right. Uh, yes. This is I, the end of the surgery session. We have a lot of additional sessions that will be coming up. So, oh, look, look what we have here. We're uh, back. Okay. So I'm going to stop my video and my audio. And so Michael and Helene, same. Okay. Hi, Heidi. I see Heidi's in from California. I'm off. <laughs> okay, goodbye. Okay, you just need to make that um like a slide view so we can just see just that one slide. Can you yeah. Can you, uh, great. Okay. So you can see it now. Perfect. Perfect. Good. Okay. Perfect. You guys, sorry for about uh, the technical difficulties, uh, but uh, computers are not our forte. So uh, once again, I want to thank everyone for having me. Uh, I'm really looking forward to tonight as a, uh, essentially an educational forum for patients and family members out there. Uh, so uh, Eileen, Helene, Michael, thank you for the invitation. Um, just as a quick outline, we'll go over a little introduction. Um, we'll go over some anatomy, some history. We'll look at indications for surgery. We'll go over some concepts uh, that we use in the operating room. I'm not going to show any uh, OR pictures because uh, they were around dinner time. And then we'll do some uh, patient-specific information. 
uh, we'll keep it short. But why is art, aortic arch surgery different? Well, uh, you know, the Marfans Foundation uh, and the rest felt it was different enough to have its own talk. I, I believe that to be true. Art surgery really gets me going um, because it's, it's complex and there's a lot uh, that you're juggling. Um, but in order to understand why it's different, we need to understand uh, what normal is. So on the left, and you guys are probably the most, uh, you know, the smartest uh, educated patients that we see in our clinic. And for that, I love it. Um, so if I'm talking below anyone, I apologize, but for those, this is supposed to be educational. Uh, on the left, we see a picture of the entire aorta broken up into different zones. Uh, we have these zones now, thank you to our SDS database. Uh, and that's really so that we can capture data, talk about uh, apples to apples and oranges to oranges when we talk about uh, different procedures or pathology that we're treating. As you see here, this is the root that Dr. Roselli spoke about, the ascending aorta. We're going to spend the majority of today's talk on the arch. Uh, and then the descending aorta or thoracoabdominal aorta, as Dr. Caselli spoke about. But since we're going to focus on the arch today, let's look at that in detail. Why is the arch important? Well, this is where all the blood flow up to the brain uh, is there. So uh, here you've got the anominate artery, which spreads uh, into the right carotid and then separates into the right subclavian. You've got the vertebral, which uh, handles really the circulation to the back of the brain. And then separately is the left carotid and then the left subclavian. Off the subclavian comes the vertebral. Uh, so parallel systems, uh, symmetric, but that can be varied. And obviously with connective tissue disorder patients, uh, Dr. Roselli showed slides like this. So I'm gonna go over this pretty quickly. Uh, with normal aortic wall, it's very organized uh, and therefore structurally it's intact. Uh, when you have a genetic uh, disposition to a connective tissue disorder, then things are very disarrayed. And unfortunately this leads to loss of structural support in the aorta which causes the catastrophes that uh, uh, can occur. Our job is to prevent these from happening beforehand. Uh, the aorta, it's the largest blood vessel in your body. Uh, to me, I always tell people it's the, the largest freeway uh, that we know of. Uh, its job is to deliver blood from the heart all the way up to the top of your head and then the bottom of your feet. The way it gets there is different branches. And so first set of branches, you've got the coronary arteries that feed the heart muscle itself. Then the large three branches that go up to the brain that are, in, that are so critical with arch surgery. And then you've got branches that go off to the spinal cord. You've got the five major branches down in the abdomen. And then at the belly button, it splits right leg and left leg. Well, the aorta, it's its own living creature because as the heart beats, it pushes that jet of blood and then the aorta distends during systole. So it expands and under that maximum expansion, the pressure in there is the top number in your blood pressure. And as the, re, as the aorta recoils due to the muscular wall, uh, it's pushing blood to the next segment. That's the lower number in your blood pressure. So what I teach my patients is, it's kind of like that game we played as kids. It's that egg toss game. You know, you toss the egg, if you didn't break it, you take a step back and you keep going until the last team standing. Well. Who's the last team standing? How did they achieve that? Well, number one, they could toss. Number two, they absorbed the impact so that egg didn't break. Well, that's the aorta's job. Because of the muscular wall, it absorbs the impact from the heart. And as the aorta gets larger, it less ability to absorb the impact, that's where there's sheer tension in the walls and that's where rupture or dissection can occur. Our job is to prevent that. Uh, obviously, to an understand why arch surgery is different, we got to understand what normal is. Here's a schematic of a heart, uh, potentially in the operating room, where we have uh, a cannula in the vein. Uh, in that vein, we're going to capture all the blood that's coming into the heart. That blood is going to be taken away. It's going to go to the heart-lung machine. And then from the heart-lung machine, it's going to be brought back in through a tube or a cannula in the arch. Well, this is going to really allow three major components to occur. One, the heart-lung machine pumps the blood, uh, so that takes over for the heart. 
and then it's going to put oxygen in, carbon dioxide out. So therefore, it takes over for the lungs. That's why they call it heart lung machine. The other major thing that it does uh, with a separate device is it can cool and warm the blood. This is critical for organ protection, specifically in arch surgery. But if we go back, if we're talking about doing surgery on the arch up here, our normal cannulation strategy isn't going to work because this is the area that we're going to be operating on in arch surgery. So why is arch surgery different? Well, it's really a balance. As the surgeon, you're balancing the heart and protection of the heart, along with providing adequate blood flow to the brain and then providing good blood flow to the rest of the body. And the conduct of the operation is critical to achieve all three perfusion beds. So of course, we have to talk about history. And uh, the first uh, arch aneurysm resection was actually in 1950 in Paris. Uh, it was a 20 year old girl who came in. They thought she had tuberculosis uh, because she had a mass that was protruding on her chest. They stuck a needle in it and it actually had blood. So the surgeon said, well, we'll take her to the operating room and see what we can do. And they resected that aneurysm. Uh, they didn't use a heart lung machine. Uh, they really just put clamps on the bottom, resected it, and then oversewed it. Uh, in the operative note, it says they were actually surprised that she made it. Well, obviously, a lot has happened since 1950. Uh, and Dr. DeBakey down in Texas uh, actually did the first ascending at arch uh, replacement. He did that with two homographs, uh, so cadaveric aortic tissue. Um, and he actually used separate cerebral perfusion. Cerebral meaning brain. So he actually perfused the brain all the way back in 1957. Um, uh, kind of the next major advance was in 1968 with Dr. Bloodwell, where he not only perfused the different brain segments, but he actually re-implanted all three of those arch vessels as an island. And I'll show pictures of that later. But really the, the uh, biggest contribution was in 1975 with Dr. Greep, uh, where circulatory arrest was really advanced. It had been done before, obviously, but Dr. Greep really advanced that. And I'm going to show you a slide later on uh, where we talk about that. And then in 1983, Dr. Borst uh, uh, fashioned the elephant trunk procedure. And we'll go through pictures of that. These are kind of some of the major advances in arch surgery. Obviously, you can't just have normal. Uh, normal is normally a three-vessel branching pattern. Uh, bovine arch, which is commonly seen in our bicuspid patients. This is where the left carotid and anominate form off of a common trunk. Uh, you can have an isolated vertebral. So instead of the vertebral coming off the subclavian, it can actually come from the arch. So if you're doing an arch replacement, you need to know that this isn't coming off of the normal location. And obviously a more extreme version is where the right subclavian is aberrant. Instead of it coming off of the anominate up here, it's coming directly from the arch and then will run around either the esophagus, sometimes it'll run in between the esophagus and trachea. And those can obviously cause problems with swallowing and breathing. Uh, since this is a very well-informed community, we also classify arches uh, uh, on the type of arch, a zone one, a type one arch, a type two arch or type three. And that's really in relation to the location of the anominate. If the anominate's in a horizontal plane with the other two vessels, it's a, it's a type one. If it's within this range, it's a type two. If it's a very, what we call cervical arch, more of a, a steeple, then we classify it as a, a, a type three arch. So why would a person need an aortic arch surgery? This is actually a, a picture of one of our Marfan's patients. Uh, who had had a previous root procedure, and she has a very large uh, abnormal arch aneurysm. So let's go through some of that. I think for this talk, you know, the, the easiest way for, I think, patients to understand this is we need to look at acute conditions, and then we need to look at chronic conditions. Uh, so acute conditions, obviously, we're looking at acute aortic syndrome. Aortic dissect dissection being the most common uh, that we can treat. Uh, obviously, there's intramural hematoma and then penetrating uh, aortic ulcers. But with our connective tissue disorder patients, it's the dreaded aortic dissection that we're treating. Uh, for the chronic case, this is where you have an aneurysmal arch. Uh, and that aneurysm could be because there's residual dissection left over 
uh, from the first operation. And because of blood pressure and weakened aorta, that now dilates uh, over time. Uh, that's why imaging is so critical to follow this. Uh, so we have certain criteria, typically, uh, you know, just as a, a generalization, 55 millimeters is what we utilize, but that obviously has to be taken into account the patient's body size. Uh, also rapid growth, if we're usually seeing growth more than about two millimeters per year, or if there's a saccular aneurysm forming. Uh, not that common in our connective tissue uh, patients, but if let's say a cannulation site had uh, an issue there, that could be one indication. So uh, with that, we can really focus on some of the acute issues. So obviously aortic dissection uh, with classifications, there's the DeBakey classification and the Stanford. Having been from Stanford, uh, I'll obviously use that, but with the Stanford A, that's where uh, the ascending aorta is involved. If the ascending aorta is not involved, we classify it as a type B aortic dissection. Uh, with the DeBakey classification, a DeBakey 1 is obviously the ascending and then extending all the way down. Uh, DeBakey 2 is limited to the ascending, and a DeBakey 3 is similar to a Stanford B. Uh, with the primary goal of a, a type A aortic dissection surgery, it's really to prevent death from aortic rupture. And that's because the ascending aorta is contained within the pericardium as the, uh, that tear starts to weep fluid. That pericardium can fill with blood, pushing pressure on the uh, heart and limit its ability to function. So uh, the first objective, replace that bad ascending aorta. We also have to excise the primary intimal tear. So primary intimal tear, 60% of the time can occur in the ascending aorta. Other times it can occur up in the arch and then go backwards. Uh, so to identifying this is crucial. And then we want to restore a competent aortic valve and then restore dominant true lumen flow distally. Uh, because as flow goes into the false lumen, obviously you have uh, only one and a half layers trying to hold that pressure together. So I'm including this with arch surgery because if your primary intimal tear is involved up in the arch, then you, you have to do an arch usually for that patient at the time of surgery. Um, also, if the cerebral vessels were compromised, uh, restoring flow is crucial. So sometimes at the, the initial operation of aortic dissection, uh, you're doing an arch. Uh, just this week, a patient came in with stroke symptoms. He was aphasic, he was moving everything, but not to command. He was found down at home. We took him to the operating room, uh, replaced his ascending, and then his nominant was reimplanted and his left carotid was reimplanted. So his own two arch, fortunately, the guy woke up and he's, he's doing very well. So these are things that surgeons have to be aware of and able to complete uh, to take care of patients. So I'd say con uh, for conventional type A repair, when we look at the data from the STS, most surgeons are really doing a super coronary anastomosis and then uh, what we call a open distal uh, in the distal ascending aorta or a hemi-arch procedure where you're going underneath the arch. Uh, when you're doing this under open conditions, you need to use what we call circulatory arrest. Uh, that we'll discuss later. Obviously, this is not the operation we would recommend for any patient with connective tissue disorder, um, and especially the Marfan's patients. With the Marfan's patients, what we've realized that the aortic root should be addressed. And when it's not addressed, uh, Dr. Bavaria has got a great paper out there that showed 40% of patients had to come back for re-intervention on their aortic root. Uh, and so when that route is uh, performed at the time of surgery, Dr. Roselli did a great talk uh, a couple weeks ago, and your options at the time of emergency surgery, you can have a composite valve graft with either a mechanical valve, a composite valve graft that you can build with a tissue valve, or now there's another product out there that's already built in, or a valve sparing aortic root procedure. Um, still done in the emergency setting, but more commonly done in the elective setting. So one of the questions that kind of comes around in our surgical community is, should surgeons address the aortic arch at the time of the first operation or the index operation? Uh, we're gonna go through three studies. I promise you, we're not gonna go in detail. It's not my style. 
uh, but I think it is important because it helps guide what we do as surgeons. Uh, the first is from Dr. Carell uh, and his French colleagues, uh, where they investigated whether total arch replacement during initial surgery should be performed routinely. And now this is for a prophylactic root aneurysm, so not emergencies. And so they did a retrospective analysis. They looked at 94 patients who had 148 aortic surgeries in a 16 year period. So that means 94 patients, some of them were getting more than one or sometimes two operations. So for primary total arch, how many times was this done in an elective route? Only 1.6% of the time. But when the patient presented with an aortic dissection, 8% of the patients got a total arch. When patients came back for secondary procedures and they got a total arch, the mean time was usually about eight years, give or take six. And then of that, how many had elective roots? 3%. And then, but how many had initially aortic dissection as their presentation? 33% of patients. So the dissection patients came back for total arches later, where only 3% of elective root surgeries came back. So the conclusion from this study, when you're a Marfan's patient and you're undergoing an elective root repair, there's no need to do a total arch at that time. Now, once again, these are guidelines and for all the listeners out there, each patient's a little bit different. So I don't want this, you know, you to, you know, be mad at your surgeon if they did a total arch. You know, these are unique situations and they have to be uh, uh, personalized. Uh, but if the patient had an aortic dissection, the need for re-intervention was precipitated by the dissection itself, not the first operation. So it kind of reiterates what we know, that dissection is bad and that residual dissection downstream, especially if the false lumen does not thrombose, can lead to problems such as dilation. The second study, uh, this was uh, with Dr. Bechet and his colleagues in France. Uh, so the purpose was to assess the prevalence, indications, and results of aortic arch replacement in Marfan's patients with and without dissection. And so they looked at a 12-year time frame where they had 54 patients that had 76 operations. The average age was 38 years old. And so, but when they, they performed 76, but when they look at the patients, because some patients transferred into their aortic center or came as second opinions, 54 patients had over 100 operations. So some patients are getting first, uh, obviously first and then second surgeries, some even third and fourth surgeries. So performing the right surgery the first time is crucial. So indication for their initial surgery was elective root. Um, and then uh, how many had acute type A's? 35%. 4% had type B's. 15 had chronic B's. Now, what was the indication for the reop? Well, residual chronic dissection in the proximal aorta, 36%. So that means in the Marfan's patients, the, do you guys see my screen? Yeah, you're good. I just lost it for some reason. Um, okay, I, I've got it. So 36% had residual proximal aorta. So even though they're Marfan's patients, the, the surgeons didn't address their root. So of course they came back. And this is similar to what Dr. Bavaria showed in his study about 40% of patients. And then uh, indication for reop was the distal aorta. So 56% of patients because they had uh, false lumen expansion or some people had acute retrograde type A's. So starting elsewhere in the arch and then came backwards 8% of the time. So once again, confirming that prophylactic replacement of the arch is not indicated when you're going in for elective root surgery. But if it appears logical in patients presenting with acute type A to consider doing the total arch to reduce the number of reoperative procedures in these generally young patients who are already paying a high toll for their disease. Uh, but, but that's a hard recommendation to do, especially when you look at our data uh, so in the STS database back in 2017, 
Uh, most operations in the United States were performed at centers where they do less than three uh, aortic procedures a year. Uh, so to ask those centers to do total arches is, a, is I would not want my surgery done there. So we got to take these with a little bit of a grain of salt. In May of this year, Dr. Cameron and his colleagues uh, presented a very interesting study, and this compared the Lowy's DEETS patients with Marfan's patients. This is a busy slide, but we're going to walk through it. So they took 79 uh, Lowy's DEETS patients, and they uh, uh, essentially separated them, those with dissection versus those without. So 11% initially presented with a dissection, 89% that didn't, but then in follow-up, some crossed over because they had dissection in their follow-up period. And the same is true for the Marfan's patients, those without, those with dissection. And so at the end of the analysis, they had 12 Lowy's Dietz with dissection, 67 without, 26 with dissection, uh, 230 Marfan's without dissection. And then in the absence of dissection, Lois Dietz patients had a higher rate of arch intervention. And that we can see down here. So here's the Lois Dietz patients with dissection. Uh, and they were similar to the Marfan's patients with dissection. But where the curves really separated was up here. And that is Lois Dietz patients that uh, came in and had surgery on their uh, root they needed secondary interventions on their arches. But Marfan's patients that came in for their root did not need interventions on their arches. So their conclusion is, in acute type A dissection, arch interventions were really similar between Lois Dietz and Marfan's patients. But when you look at elective root repair, the Lois Dietz patients had an increased risk for sub subsequent arch interventions. So therefore, consideration of addressing the arch in Lois D's patients for elective root repair should be considered. Now, once again, this is a challenge too because a lot of the graphs we have are really made for adults, the sizes of them. And the Lois D's patients usually present sooner than the Marfan's patients. So Dr. Cameron's got a very nice uh, discussion in his paper that talks about this. So that's it for the, the scientific component of it. Uh, as far as studies. The rest, we're all going to do clinical applicability. So once again, should surgeons address the aortic arch at the first operation? I'm going to show you a picture that I hate showing, but my team loves showing it, so I threw it in for them. And that is, it really depends on the indication of the first operation. So if you're there for elective root surgery, Marfan's probably not going to get a total arch, uh, but Lois Dietz patients for elective root should be considered because they have a higher risk for arch intervention. Um, uh, so in aortic dissection, obviously the similar uh, arch issues for Lois Dietz and Marfans. Uh, um, so it's gonna be patient specific because you always have to worry about the fate of the distal aorta. Okay, so with that, let's talk a little bit about aortic arch surgery uh, specifically. So there's several different types of arch procedures. I just wanted to make it simpler for everyone uh, so that you could retain this information. Uh, and we're going to look at three kind of common procedures. The first is the hemi-arch. The hemi-arch is really where you're doing a partial arch. And this is what we call a uh, peninsula style technique, where you essentially have a peninsula of Dacron going underneath the arch. The purpose here is to try and eliminate as much arch tissue without doing a total arch. And in the acute setting, such as an aortic dissection, this is found to do very well for connective tissue disorder patients, as well as non-connective tissue disorder patients and by far is the most commonest procedure that we do. Um, next is the island reimplant. Why is it called an island? Well, we're taking an island of the head vessels and reimplanting it into the graft and then suturing it into the proximal descending thoracic aorta, okay? This is not what we recommend or would do for most patients with connective tissue disorder, uh, especially Marfan's or Lowy's Dietz because we're leaving aortic tissue behind. 
So the most commonest procedure is where we do a total reimplantation. Total reimplantation means we're going to get rid of all the aortic tissue and we're going to do individual reimplantations. Now, this picture is a representation of what we call a four branch uh, arch technique, four being the three to the head vessels. And then the fourth is a perfusion graft so we can provide blood flow from the heart lung machine. There's a variety of configurations that surgeons have done to reconstruct these vessels. And there's a variety of commercially available graphs that allow us to make these connections. One is there's trifurcated graphs where you connect the head vessels together and then you re-implant it into the arch in one location. So not to bore you with the technical aspects of it, uh, we, we have lots of tools in our tool belt. Uh, the elephant trunk procedure. This is, this is important for our connective tissue disorder patients, especially Marfans and Lois Dietz, where they, they have risk for intervention on the remaining segments of their aorta. And if you do a root total arch, the descending's at risk. And so if you leave an elephant trunk behind, you're setting yourself up for success. So let's walk through and see what that really means. So we're taking a Dacron graft, we're gonna intussuscept it upon itself. So fold it in, kind of like what you do for your socks, put it in, and then once it's in, while we have the patient under circulatory arrest, we can drop that into the descending thoracic aorta like an elephant trunk hanging down. We can then unfurl the remaining graft and then reconnect the arch. Obviously with our connective tissue disorder patients, we're going to do you know, the branch graft so that we get rid of all that bad aorta. But the purpose of this is we're leaving graft down here in the descending thoracic aorta. So in this representation, this patient has an aneurysm of the descending thoracic aorta. It's not big enough to get intervened on now, but it may be in the future if it grows. So we're making it safer for the patient, saving it for the surgeon, and making it a shorter operative time by leaving this down there. Because now when we come in through the side for a thoraco, we'll be able to put a cross clamp down here rather than up in the arch and you know putting nerves at risk or blood vessels or anastomosis at risk. So it's essentially a preparatory step for a stage procedure. Uh, the sun procedure. So this is uh, you know, one thing that's talked about in the aortic community. And I gotta say, it, it's a common procedure that a lot of us do for aortic dissections. Uh, how that's different, we've got a four branch graft, but this is actually a stent graft. And instead of a elephant trunk, this is termed a frozen elephant trunk because it's a stent graft that expands uh, with springs uh, with cloth inside. Now, once again, the professional advisory board, the expert consensus document, and the AHA all agree that stent grafts are contraindicated in patients with Marfan syndrome and related connection tissue disorders. The thought is with this that, all right, it may work because you pick the size, but if this now expands, you're going to have problems. And so uh, obviously this is not a mandate. Stent grafts have been used in connective tissue disorder patients. Um, uh, not as a first resort. Uh, it's usually a secondary resort when the patient's too sick and we're going to use stent grafts to bridge uh, to a more definitive operation. Or where stent grafts have been utilized is uh, stent grafts require landing zones. Uh, so the proximal landing zone and the distal landing zone, and there may be an aneurysm in between. Well, if that proximal and distal are Dacron graft from previous surgeries, that could be one indication. But the talk's not on stent graft, so we're going to put that subject to rest. Maybe we can address it in the Q&A. Uh, here's a picture uh, and some video of a 19-year-old Marfan's patient who came in a while ago. He had a root aneurysm that hadn't been operated, and you can see his initial presentation was a type B aortic dissection. So you can see the true lumen here, the false lumen here. Well, he went and got his uh, root replacement done. Uh, he moved away. Uh, got his root replacement done elsewhere. And then we met him again five years ago. And now he represented with a second type B dissection in the setting of a previous B. 
And this one now went retrograde up into the arch. And if you look on the left screen here, here's his true lumen, here was his false lumen, and the true lumen split again. This is an ominous sign in Marfan's patients, but we've got big problems. So now his arch is big and his descending is big. Down in here was about eight centimeters. Uh, you know, he was your typical 22 year old kid. He didn't want to really face some of his medical issues. He was, you know, uh, going through some tough spots in life and now, now he had a tougher one. Uh, so we did a stage procedure. Uh, so the first operation, we addressed his arch. So we did a total arch and then left an elephant trunk down in here. So we brought him back to fight another day and then the thoraco was done. So here's a completion. Uh, unfortunately, uh, the video broke on the other one. So I had to get rid of the first, but here's now he's, his aorta is completely replaced from the root, his total arch. Here's the elephant trunk that was left in place. And now here is his completion thoraco abdominal with the intercostals in place. So these stage procedures are critical. And so setting yourself up for success for this next operation is crucial. So back to the original question, why is arch surgery different? Well, we're balancing perfusion to the heart as well as blood flow to the brain and then blood flow to the rest of the body. So how can we achieve this safely? Well, hypothermic circulatory rest is a standard. Uh, uh, Michael, I threw this picture in there for you. So uh, this is a picture that was uh, talked about notoriously at Stanford by Dr. Miller. And this is uh, Dr. Greep's orange canoe. And it lived between OR 13 and 10. Uh, back in 1975, the patients were cooled down. The patient would be put in the canoe, ice would be put around the patient, and then the surgeons would conduct the operation while the patient was in the canoe. To warm the patient, the canoe would be deflated and the ice would be removed. Why? The colder you go, the better the organs are protected. And we know this from transplantation. Uh, obviously you can harvest organs, you can put them in ice, store them for certain periods of time based on their ischemic time, and then re-implant them. Well, without taking it out of the body, we can cool the body down, protect the brain, protect the heart, and then protect all the other vital organs, the spinal cord, the liver, the kidneys, the bowel. Uh, and with this, we have some nomenclature. Uh, this nomenclature has really been thrown around and uh, it's been hard to have a consensus, but we actually have consensus now. Profound hypothermia, we consider less than 14 degrees Celsius. Uh, deep hypothermia, 14 to 20 degrees. Moderate hypothermia, 20 to 28. And mild hypothermia, 28 to 34 degrees. And by the way, this is Dr. Miller in 1975, which he thinks this is with an anesthesia resident. So the consensus on hypothermia and arch surgery, uh, bottom line on this, the colder you go, the more protection that you have of the brain and the more you're shutting down the metabolism. We all hear about the little kids that fall into lakes in Minnesota and frozen, you thaw them out and the next day they go to school. Same concept, cold is protective. And with that, it allows us to perform operations and the colder you are, the longer the organs are protected. But hypothermia is not the end all and be all. You need adjuncts. And adjunct is perfusion to the brain. Uh, and this is a concept that we've, uh, uh, has been around. And this is kind of like religion in some centers, uh, aortic centers. Some people believe in anagrade, some people believe in retrograde. So to help educate you guys, let's talk through that. Anagrade cerebral perfusion is where we're providing blood from the heart-lung machine in an anagrade fashion, meaning forward flow to the brain. So it's going into the artery, either through an axillary artery, which is common, or an anominate artery so that it can go up to the right carotid, feed the brain through the circle of Willis, which is connections between the right and the left. It can then come down through the left. Uh, we're monitoring in the operating room. When we see differentials, we can always add another cannula up the left carotid directly. So instead of unilateral anagrade cerebral perfusion, we consider that now bilateral cerebral perfusion. 
with retrograde cerebral perfusion, retrograde backwards. So we're essentially providing blood through the vein, then you have to change your heart lung circuit a little bit here, but providing blood back through the superior vena cava. So it goes back up through the jugular veins to the brain. And then through the veins, it's gonna go venules, then capillaries, capillaries to arterioles, arterioles to arteries, arteries, now down to the carotids. But all the while perfusing the brain with cold blood. Essentially, we're creating a brain freeze. Uh, the whole point of that is to lower the cellular metabolism of the brain at the time. And uh, for arch surgeons, this is mandatory. Uh, one of the ways we can do that, as we showed, is the right axillary perfusion. So this is where we're instilling flow, usually through a graft, from the heart lung machine. This is a picture of an aortic dissection. So in the red is the true lumen, in the yellow is the false lumen. So where the false lumen preferentially pressurizes and can shut down the true lumen, we want to restore true lumen flow so we can get blood back up there. So this to me is what we would uh, strive for. This would be an ideal scenario. We're pressurizing the true lumen and the false lumen will now uh, get smaller. But one of the things that you have to worry about and it's mandatory when we do these surgeries, if you have a tear elsewhere and you institute flow and now it goes into the false lumen, you're actually gonna be hurting the patient. Now the false lumen is pressurized, you're constricting true lumen flow, and that can minimize end organ perfusion. So in order to recognize that, there's a variety of monitoring systems we utilize in the operating room. So cerebral monitoring is crucial to achieve our task. And that is, there's a variety. There's bispectral index, which is looking at essentially the depth of anesthesia. There's EEG, where we're actually, uh, looking at the electrical activity of the brain. There's transcranial Doppler. There's near infrared spectroscopy, which is look almost like a pulse ox for the brain. And then there's somatory spoke evoke potentials and then oxygen saturation. I gotta say there's, uh, once again, these are really institution specific, but the majority of institutions are using uh, bispectral index and near infrared spectroscopy or NEARS. Uh, as in medicine, uh, there's if there's something good, there's always some bad to it. So the colder you go, uh, the bigger problems you have with bleeding because the proteins uh, that form coagulation or blood clot, are uh, they're temperature dependent because proteins are temperature dependent. And when you cool, those proteins are gonna change. When you warm, you hope those proteins go back so they fit the puzzle pieces to form clot. But a lot of times when you go really cold, they don't do that. So therefore hypothermia inhibits platelet function. Obviously the longer the surgery, uh, you tend to dilute your coagulation factors. And then when you're on the heart lung machine, you've got a variety of problems that can occur. So therefore in the operating room, we have point of care testing to assess before surgery, what does someone's coagulation profile look like? Uh, and then at that time, if it looks good, we can actually take blood off of the patient, just like donating at the blood bank, but we don't cool it and freeze it like the blood bank, because once again, that would interfere with the proteins. We keep it in the OR, we keep it on a rocker table so that we can instill it at the end of the case. So that's the patient's own whole blood that has all those coagulation factors. So that's the best transfusion you can get because it's your own. I view trans, uh, uh blood transfusions as a liquid transplant. Um, but having said that, a lot of times in arch surgery, we have to give you some. So using point of care testing, instead of hitting you with the blood bank kitchen sink, we're being very methodical about what we need to give the patients. Obviously in the post-op setting, there's a variety of things that we're looking for. We obviously need a monitor for bleeding when we get up to the ICU. We need a monitor for tissue perfusion, uh, whether that's uh, direct measurements, like looking at the urine output, or feeling the pulses or indirect measurements like checking laboratory values for the liver, the lactate levels or the kidney function. We obviously wanna do early extubation. Um, a lot of times with circulatory rest, I remember the patients would be asleep for two or three days after surgery, you know, 15 years ago. Nowadays, it's very common for these patients to get woken up 
you know, one to two hours after surgery and be extubated. Extubated meaning get the breathing tube out and get off the ventilator. Why is that important? Well, one, we start your recovery. And by starting your recovery, we're going to get a very good neuroassessment. Neuroassessment's critical. Uh, the risk of, uh, you know, stroke in arch surgery is anywhere between two to three uh, percent for elective surgery, but for emergency surgery, it can be anywhere up to 10 to 15 percent. So that's why brain protection is so critical. And that balance in arch surgery is, is what makes it very challenging, but fun at the same time. Uh, obviously, early mobility, getting patients out of bed. A lot of times our patients after art surgery, they're sitting in a chair about six hours afterwards. But also during the hospitalization, maintaining that mobility to prevent complications. Obviously, pulmonary issues are a priority. So working on the breathing machine and using your incentive spirometry and getting out of bed is critical. Um, specific with art surgery, we need to monitor swallowing ability. Why is that? Well, it always goes back to anatomy. And with that, the left recurrent laryngeal nerve, which hopefully you guys can see this pointer, but in, off the vagus, the left recurrent laryngeal nerve wraps around the arch. And it usually does this between the left carotid and the subclavian. Well, if we're replacing that, that nerve can be at risk. Usually in the acute setting, we can, uh, you know, sometimes we can see it depending on how much aortic destruction has occurred. Uh, for chronic aneurysms, you can usually see it, but sometimes the inflammation can make it challenging. Why is the left recurrent laryngeal nerve important? Because it goes back up here to the larynx and it innervates the vocal cords. Here's a uh, direct laryngoscopy of the vocal cords. The vocal cords normally sit midline, And then when you talk, the, the nerves pull the vocal cords apart. Well, if the nerve is injured, then that vocal cord is pulled off to the side. Well, the problem with that is now you have an op direct opening to the lungs. Well, the saliva that we have in our mouth starts breaking down steak. If you swallow and that saliva misses the first barrier, which is the epiglottis, now the saliva is heading down towards the vocal cords. The vocal cords, vocal cords should be shut to protect the lungs. If you have a paralyzed vocal cord, the spit can go right down into the uh, trachea and then start breaking down the lungs because it can't tell the difference between steak or lung tissue. Uh, because of that, aspiration is a risk. So we want to assess the patient's vocal cord, which is a very easy bedside test to do. Post-operative imaging is critical. Uh, with that, we need to, we're going to be following echoes. We're going to be following CT scans. Uh, some patients can be followed with MRIs. And obviously for patients that came in in an acute setting with a dissection, we're going to want to do genetic testing to try and get to the etiology as to why that happened. So uh, what does the future look like? Well, in the field of aortic surgery, we need, to, we need to clean up our act a little bit. And there was a consensus statement that tried to do that. And that is, you know, looking at uh, standardizing clinical endpoints, making sure that we have meaningful definitions so that we can then obtain meaningful data from institutions. And I got to say, when Dr. Bavaria was head of the STS, he did a phenomenal job on improving the uh, STS database and, in, and really beefed up the aortic component of that. Uh, with that, we're actually able to assess outcomes. And the most recent one looked at circulatory arrest in uh, arch surgery. And it showed that most centers around the country were really just doing circulatory arrest. But when you do circulatory arrest without that adjunct cerebral perfusion, operative mortality was around 15% and stroke risk was around 12%. When you add the adjunct of cerebral protection, either anagrade or retrograde, you're actually decreasing operative mortality and decreasing strokes. So, and what's the objective for this? Well, obviously improve patient care. That's our end game. In order to achieve all this, you need an aortic center team. Uh, that's gonna comprise a variety of individuals, the surgeons, so the cardiac surgeons, the vascular surgeons, the orthopedic surgeons for uh, the orthopedic issues that the connective tissue disease patients have, obviously the cardiologists, the cardiac anesthesias that help in the OR, the radiologists that help with the imaging, the geneticists that help us to de decipher some of these uh, you know, rare mutations or variants of unknown significance. 
and then OBs, ophthalmology, your nursing team that's obviously you know up on the floors in the ORs, your dedicated navigators and people that run the clinics, uh, like with us, Rita and also Meg, and then advanced imaging with our 3D lab, obviously your laboratory for pathology and testing, and then you need the IT support to uh, square all this away. So with this, I, I, I gotta brag about our team. In the upper left, we got some of the members of our clinic team. Uh, Rita's up in there, and then Meg Bogle's off over to the right. Uh, up on the right is some of our OR staff. Bottom left is the, some of our ICU staff. And up on the, uh, here is uh, one of our PAs, Jeff Saunders, and then uh, our nursing staff on the telemetry unit. So with that, we're gonna end and then start taking questions. But uh, I wanna thank the Marfans uh, Foundation for having me. Uh, this opportunity. I love teaching patients, uh, but I, it all goes back to where I, I started from. And that is Dr. Miller trained me how to do this along with Dr. Mitchell. And then uh, Dr. Lang taught me the medical aspect of this and really uh, the love of taking care of the Marfan's patients and the other connective tissue disorders. So with that, thank you very much. And I'm uh, going to stop sharing my screen. Great. Now it's just you and me. That was, that was, Amazing. I learned, I learned, and I learned an awful lot. There are things that we really haven't talked about before. So you were right. This was definitely needed to do something just on aortic art surgery. Um, lots of questions. I see only a couple that were posed tonight, but right now we're going to go to the ones that were asked ahead of time. Um, so you, you know, you talked a lot about um, the need for aortic art surgery after somebody presented with dissection and less so if it was prophylactic uh, surgery. But what are the indications for that aortic arch? Um, repair. Um, you know, you hear about with the root, you hear about the size of the, the size or are there symptoms? So how do you know if you need, how do you know, or how does the, how does the patient know, or how does the surgeon know? Sure. Yeah. You know, there's not a lot of symptoms that occur with arch aneurysms. Obviously, if it's so big, you're going to get compression on adjacent structures. So sometimes people will have hoarseness because that left recurrent laryngeal nerve I talked about gets stretched out. As it gets stretched out, it's not going to work on that left vocal cord. And so people can, uh, you know, describe hoarseness. Uh, but I got to say, a lot of these are found on uh, interval imaging studies that are done. And so after an aortic dissection, it's mandatory to do imaging. You know, the guidelines say at discharge, one month, six months, and then a year. And then based on, you know, what you're seeing, uh, that's where we see it. And as far as guidelines, as far as size, it's usually around 55 millimeters, but you have to take that with a grain of salt as to, you know, how tall, you know, the body surface area of the patient. And, you know, with our Marfans community, there's a lot of tall Marfans, obviously. We also have some short Marfans patients too. So you, you can't use the absolute size. So this is where, you know, that's why I love doing this stuff. It's personalized medicine. You got the guidelines, but you got to take it with that patient. So we're not just treating a CT scan or genetics, we got to put it in their body and see how does it fall out uh, with the whole thing. How long does that surgery take, the aortic arch surgery? Or so does it matter which one of the ones that you showed us? It looks like a, yeah, it looks complicated. <laughs> yeah, so I think if we had to walk through, if if we're talking about a primary operation, the hemi arch procedure, I got to say, is relatively quick. Uh, the open portion to sew that. You know, one, I always, I always tell my OR team, we're sewing this many circles today. So to sew that one circle distally usually takes anywhere between 14 to 25 minutes, uh, depending on who's helping and how much, how bad the tissue is. Um, when you're doing a total arch implantation, each circle, you know, the smaller circles usually take about five to eight minutes to do. Um, but if it's, if it's an acute dissection and the tissue is really torn, you got to add a little bit more to it. Um, if it's a redo surgery, the, the redos are always really driven by the amount of scar tissue left behind. The good thing about uh, having a connective tissue disorder is the scar tissue usually isn't that bad uh, compared to someone that doesn't have a connective tissue disorder. So redos in the Marfan's population is actually a little bit easier. So that's one thing that people have to look forward to. It's not going to take as long. Um, but uh, I'd say total from, you know, start of operation to finish for a hemi arch procedure, usually about four and a half to five hours for a total arch, I'd say probably six to eight. Yeah, it's a, it's a long time. Yeah. I was yeah. going to say it's more than just you sewing. Right? Yeah, <laughs> no, yeah, absolutely. It's, you know, that's the fun stuff. But it's um, what's fun about it is, is 
each step of the way, as you introduce perfusion, you're, you're assessing, all right, is the heart taken care of? Is the brain taken care of? And distally, how's the kidneys doing? How's the liver doing? And, you know, it's balancing all of those. And also it's with the conduction of the operation. You know, if you just focus, all right, we're going to do the arch vessels now, and then we'll address distally and then proximally, you're going to be there a whole lot longer. And so it's, it's a dance. You can do a little bit here and then go back down here and then go up there based on where you are in your temperature management. So there's a lot of temperature management that goes into it, as we talked about. And so you conduct the operation based on temperature. So that allows you to go around. And, so, and just going back to that brain perfusion, right near the end of your talk, you said that mortality was lower if that was done, but you didn't yeah. give any numbers. People are asking about mortality rates. So, yeah, so go over that again. Yeah, so I, I think it's um, it's a little bit hard to give a general, but if you're, and I knew people would want to be pinned down with a general number. A if, range. If, yeah, a range. So if you're looking at elective arch replacement, mortality on that, you know, nationally is going to be somewhere on the order of, you know, two to 6% for elective. But if you're talking about emergency surgery, you're looking 10 to 15, 20%. Uh, now, obviously, if you now separate that out into who use brain perfusion instead of just uh, uh, hypothermia, the numbers with hypothermia are worse. When you do hypothermia and cerebral perfusion, it's less. So we've got to, we've got to get surgeons to start doing more cerebral protection. And that kind of leads into um, something else that you, you touched on a little bit. Um, if people can't go to Hogue, I mean, how do people find an experienced surgeon? What should they ask? Like, they don't know where to go. They need to at least know the questions so they can find the right surgeon. Yeah, I think, I think that's where the Marfans Foundation has done an incredible job of helping direct. And uh, also the, uh, you know, a lot of the patients are socially connected, so uh, they can, um, you know, find that out from friends. But I think questions that you should ask your surgeon is, uh, how many procedures do you do in the surgery that you need done? Um, and, you know, you can ask patients what their, you know, outcomes are. I think that's a very fair question. And I'd be careful of the surgeon that doesn't want to answer that question. That's a great point. So, and, but I got to say, for, from a community standpoint, uh, as far as the aorta community, on the surgical side, there's a real push for regionalization of these problems. And I got to say, in Orange County, that's, it's already kind of happened. And you know, as your aortic program builds, people get the word out and then, you know, tr you know, even if someone shows up at another institution with a problem, you know, th these aren't problems a lot of surgeons want to deal with. So the ER gets on the phone and they're dialing for doctors. And so that's why, you know, having a center where his phone lines are always open is critical. Great. Thank you. All right. So we're going to go to Jill who asked her a question before we started the presentation tonight. Um, she says her native arch is still intact, but she has background, background everywhere else. Is the arch surgery more difficult when the ascending and descending aorta have already been done? Uh, I wouldn't say it's more difficult. Uh, I think what would add a little difficulty is that you're now doing redo surgery from the front. But mm -hmm. once again, the Marfan's uh, uh, scar tissue is less. So that's a good thing. Um, and uh, you now have landing zones for your graft. So we're going to try and, uh, and you know, I obviously don't know Jill's anatomy, but what we would say is we're going to try and land the Dacron graft and suture it to the uh, descending graft so that we eliminate all the tissue. And, you know, just because that's the one area of uh, native tissue you have left, you may not never need a surgery if, if there's no enlargement there. Uh, and what we've, some of the talk among the uh, aortic surgeons is uh, changes in blood flow. Um, when we put a Dacron graft in the ascending aorta, it kind of goes back to that original slide where the aorta expands and it contracts. So it goes back to the egg game. Well, if we replace that proximal aorta with a graft, that graft doesn't expand or contract. So now you're sending that uh, impact zone distally. So it's resonating. And a lot of our proximal aortic patients describe this. And I'm sure people out there will notice that after their surgeries, they went home and then they were sleeping at night and they're like, oh, I hear my heartbeat. 
Well, it's because that Dacron graft, I always tell them it's like a bass drum. The heart, the blood hits it, it hits it and it resonates and it goes up to the native aorta and the carotids go up in the bone and in the bone, that's where your ears, the uh, um, ear membrane, the tympanic membrane is, and that's how sounds generated. So your brain registers your heart sounds. So that is, um, uh, it's, it's a sound of a good heart. That's a lot of anatomy today. We're getting vocal cords and ears. And yeah. Just, just about the vocal cords, we can go back to that for a second. Does that, does that, does it go back? Uh, so some patients, it's a partial injury. Um, meaning it comes back on its own. So sometimes we watch it depending on, you know, uh, when the ear, nose and throat doctors look in there and they see movement, that's something we'd probably watch. If we're not seeing movement, uh, then uh, it doesn't mean that it's gone forever. It means it could just be stunned. Uh, and so what the ear, nose and throat doctors can do is uh, they borrowed a little bit from the plastic surgeons. So they can actually inject filler into the vocal cord and beef it up so that where it's separated by injecting it, they beef it up so it can meet midline. So then people get their voice back and their airways protected so they can start eating. Uh, some patients need repeat procedures until it comes back. Other patients, especially in patients where it's an acute dissection and that dissection occurred in the arch uh, and that, that area is like a grenade went off. Uh, those patients may have a permanent injury. So you know, everyone's have- different. I've spoken with people who've had aortic surgery and they have that voice issue. I never knew what it was connected to yeah. there. That was I'll great. go back to anatomy. Now I know. Um, so if we can talk about low yeast eats for a second. You mentioned um, that patients having elective root replacement surgery, you generally recommend a total reimplantation of the arch at the same time, including an elephant trunk, or you would think about it. I don't know. You're we're hesitant about recommendations here. Yeah, I think... Um, I think, you know, from Dr. Cameron's uh, uh, paper, just May of 2020, he raises, the, qu- he raises the, the question that maybe we should be doing total arches in the Lois Dietz patients that had elective root surgery. And that, he kind of threw that out there for surgeons to, you know, discuss. And, you know, there's a lot of rebuttal. Uh, you know, Dr. Cameron's one of the smartest guys I know. So if he's telling us to think about it, I think we should. Um, now, as, once again, the Lois Dietz patients are presenting at earlier ages, and so that creates some other technical challenges as far as the graphs and stuff like that. So, once again, it's going to be an individual uh, recommendation. Okay, great. Okay. Um, is this, so this surgery, the aortic arch surgery, is this always done um, in an open, open way? Is there any way to avoid open surgery? Yeah, well, for uh, in our non-connective tissue disorder patients, we can, and it's called a debranching procedure. So that's where instead of uh, you know connecting everything through the graft, we would actually separate those head vessels, those three, disconnect them, and connect them to a graft, and then uh, put that on the ascending aorta. And then in the arch, we could deploy a stent graft to cover that area. So it's, it's what we call a hybrid arch. There is technology coming out uh, where we have fenestrated stent grafts where we can, you know, the uh, zone two arch is coming out. So it's essentially a branch graft device to fit in the left subclavian or even take it into a zone one repair where it goes into the left carotid. Um, so that stent graft technology is out there, but once again, uh, not ready for prime time in the connective tissue disorder patients. I think that's a that's the that's a key point yeah. there. Yeah, everybody wants that, but of course everybody wants that. But it, it the problem is is that the, the problem was in within the wall of the aorta, um, and so by putting the stent graft in there, it, it may destabilize things. I, I think that's important to know. Like why why not? You know. Yeah. So yeah. Um, so there, the, like- and, it, and it goes back to the the stent graft technology. It's using radial forces to put pressure on that wall. Well, that's the whole objective of blood pressure control. We're trying to minimize the shear stress on the aortic wall. Right, that's, the, that's where all the weakness is. That's the connective tissue, so. Um, so what likelihood is there for scar tissue to develop after a full arch replacement and how would scar tissue impact the patient? Um, so yes, scar tissue is gonna happen. Anytime we do surgery, scar tissue will occur. Um, mm-hmm. 
where uh, the good thing about connective tissue disorder patients, their scar tissue is less, so that's good. So if another reoperation would be necessary, uh, it, it's not gonna be as bad as the non-connective non tissue disorder patient. I think, uh, you know, there's not a lot of scar tissue problems that can occur. One thing that can occur after surgery is uh, um, the pericardium around the heart uh, can be inflamed and that can actually stick to the heart. It's called uh, constrictive pericarditis. I gotta say, I've, I've never seen constrictive pericarditis in uh, one of our connective tissue disorder patients. And I think it goes back to the underlying uh, uh, components. Um, can you talk a little bit more about the aortic size, which you mentioned before, and you said it's different, different number based on if the person's bigger or smaller. So it's, so if you're saying 55 centimeters, is that, how does that compare for the larger person or for the smaller person? What are you looking for? Yeah. So what we're looking for is essentially the size of the aorta, uh, in the segment we're interested in. Um, and, uh, but also what's, the, what's it doing over time on serial follow-up? Is it stable or is it growing? Is it ever gonna regress? Not unless we cut it out and put a graft in. Um, there is different ways to measure that are critical. And we see a lot of patients at our institution for second opinions, and they've been told somewhere else that they need surgery. Uh, and then they come in and see us and the measurements were wrong. So it's really important to uh, measure appropriately and do orthogonal measurements uh, so you're really getting the, the diameter of that area. Uh, when it comes to the body size, uh, not so much the arch, but in the ascending aorta, there's a lot of controversy with this. Um, you know, if, if you're a, uh, I always say, our five foot tall, 90 pound nurse, her aorta should be significantly smaller uh, than mine. And mine should be significantly smaller than the six foot five, 280 pound tight end for the chargers. And so it, it's got to be ratioed. And there's certain tools we used um, uh, to determine that. And that's the aortic ratio and the aortic size index. So we're looking at patients' height, weight, and then their uh, aortic size in the different segments. Uh, there's a uh, big Yale aortic nomogram uh, that actually you know, gives some comparison out of Dr. Elvateriati's lab in Yale uh, that kind of helps guide surgeons as to where people fit into either low, moderate, or um, uh, high risk for aortic emergency. I know with children, we talk about Z-score, which is... Yeah, Z-score Z -score is used specifically for the aortic root, mm -hmm. um, and that's, that's critical and, and gets used for adults as well. Right, and that's the, the different, how, how the differentiation from normal? Yeah, differentiation for normal. You know, there's kind of a, a range for normal, and then we're taking into account the patient's height, the weight, and even their gender to come up with those scores. When you, when you, when you, when you replace the aorta, this is a good, great question. I never saw this one before. When you replace the aorta with the Dacron, how, what's the diameter of that tube? Or is it based on the person? Yeah. So we choose it based on the anatomy that we're replacing. Um, obviously when you're trying to sew one circle to the other circle, it's easier to sew it if it's the same size. Um, but sometimes based on the curvature of the arch, uh, you may choose one area based on the size, but then when you bring it down, it's a whole different geometric form. And so, uh, you know, we're pretty good at, at sewing things together and looking at size differential, maybe a three to one ratio. Uh, if it gets too big, then that's where we'd say, all right, we're going to choose a separate graft and connect them. Mm -hmm. uh, so uh, there's a variety of graft sizes that we keep in our operating rooms. We choose it uh, based on the location we're treating. That's great. All right. You answered, you already answered so many of these questions that were submitted in advance. It's an amazing job. And there are some other people asking questions very personal to their situation. So probably, probably not the best venue for that here. Um, okay. But why don't you hold on and we're going to do some closing slides and then we'll ask you for some final comments. Okay. Sure. So let me uh, share my screen again, everybody. And just remind you that if your questions were not answered tonight, um, please submit them to Jan, the nurse in our help center at markdan.org slash ask, and she will get back to you. Um, as Michael mentioned earlier, we still have lots of programming coming up. Um, next week, we have Dr. Jay Shaw from the Mayo Clinic in Arizona talking about adult cardiology issues. We've talked about surgery this entire month, and so now we're going back to some of the basic issues on cardiology before and after your surgery. 
And then in March, we have personal perspectives panel. And this is um, dads with Martha in, Lois Dietz, Beds, um, and their input. We talk a lot, we hear a lot from Martha and moms or moms of, of uh, kids with beds or low seats, but you know, dads have opinions as well. <laughs> and um, it's important to hear their insights so that anybody who knows them, loves them, and wants to know how they're thinking about this, it's a big uh, impact. And we have uh, uh, Mitchell Cariani, the genetic counselor from Stanford, who's gonna be in there helping out with that as well. And something that we announced just today, new on our website, um, new announcement is our new kids club is starting March 18th. It's the first night of it. Um, this is uh, by request of parents all over the place who wanted um, a safe place for their kids who are age nine to 12 to get together. And we have our social worker, Andrea, um, leading that. Um, it's, a fun, it's, not, it's not counseling or therapy. It's a, it's a fun place, fun, safe place for your kids to get together. So I'll put the, uh, I'll put the link to register in the follow-up email I send you guys tomorrow. Um, we are on top of COVID, of course. Um, there's lots of questions since this whole thing started. Um, we have webinars on our website. The recordings are there. Statements from our professional advisory board. Um, most, most recent one is about vaccines. We have a weekly COVID support group Monday nights. And of course, we have uh, masks available um, through our swag store. So I'll send you that link tomorrow. Maybe Helene put that in the, uh, in the chat tonight. But wear your mask. And then other opportunities coming up soon, as Michael mentioned, our virtual annual, annual conference is July 8th to 11th. We are gonna be doing so much more than medical presentations. Great opportunities for you guys to connect with each other and with some of our amazing doctors. We have other virtual support groups. We have our Walk for Victory season kicking off um, next weekend virtually. Hopefully we'll get to do some in person this spring, but definitely virtual to start. And obviously lots of places for you all to connect with us on social media. Um, almost finally, I think we have Marfan Awareness Month. We are almost done with Marfan Awareness Month. I hope that you guys have seen a lot online and um, have enjoyed some of the programming that we've offered. We have our new t-shirts celebrating our 40th anniversary. Um, we have our day of giving this week and that's a way for you to help us um, make sure that we can continue do, doing education and awareness opportunities to help you all. And then to stay connected to us and get on our text list and you can text Marfan to this number or LDS or VEDS, whichever um, community that you identify with. And we'll make sure that we, you are you know, one of the first to learn about new opportunities that we have. And so with that, I just wanna first ask um, Dr. Caffarelli if he has some final words and thoughts for our community here tonight. We had almost hundred people on. Um, and so it's a great turnout. Absolutely. Uh, thank you very much for having me. It was a pleasure. I always love teaching patient stuff. So uh, I'm really looking forward to seeing everyone in person in Newport Beach in 2022. We And we look forward to being there. Michael, any final words? First of all, thank you, Tony. Uh, terrific. Absolutely terrific, as expected. So uh, we deeply appreciate your involvement. Also, I was just reflecting quickly back on I think it was Jess Winder uh, from uh, London that was saying she would miss or he would miss the uh, programming um, because you know this was the final one a series. That got me thinking just briefly about the annual conference because we're also hoping July 8 through 11 will have international opportunities for viewing that as well. So if you've never been to a Mark Van annual conference, it won't be like the in-person one would normally be or will be next year at Hogue but it would be terrific to attend. So keep that in mind as well as that, get, that gets announced. So thank you. Have a wonderful evening. All right. All right. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, Helene. It was, thanks. I always appreciate your help. And thanks to everybody for joining tonight. Thank you, Tony. We really uh, learned a lot tonight from you. So thanks so much. You're very welcome. Have Good a great night, evening. Bye-bye. Bye-bye, everybody.